And so here we are, Matthew chapter 5. This is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus is um, <clears throat> teeing up, you know, one of the, the greatest sermon ever given by the greatest preacher that ever lived. And so the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount is known as the Beatitudes. And so we've had all these different, uh, uh, there's a lot of ways to describe them. Beautiful attitudes, blessed attitudes. Uh, but what Jesus is doing is kind of flipping culture upside down. And each, each one of these Beatitudes, I don't think there's a bottom to them. Like we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks on each one. There's so much there. There's a lot of depth there. Um, and so today, though, we're, we're, this is really, I've been looking forward to this one the most for, for a lot of different reasons. But um, I'm going to read it to you first. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. So last week, we talked about blessed are the merciful. They'll obtain mercy. And so now here we are rolling into verse 8. The New International Version, I, I'm going to read it from that version first. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will, they'll see God. Does anybody want to see God? I, don't, I, don't, I think even an atheist would want to see God, right? I, think, I don't know if there's a person on the planet that wouldn't answer yes to that question. Absolutely we want to see God. So Jesus is giving us an insight here to the way that we do that. And he says it's about, all about what's going on on the inside of us. I'm going to read it out of a different translation. This is the message. It's a paraphrased version. You're blessed when you get your inside world. Your mind, your heart, I would add to that your emotions, put right. Because when your inside world gets put right, then you're going to see God in the outside world. And so, so, so Jesus really expounds on this beatitude in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. And we're not going to go through all of that this morning. But what we're seeing now is he's making this faith and coming to him and knowing God way more about the inside than about the outside. So we know he's talking to the disciples, he's talking to a crowd that's gathered around, but he's kind of firing shots at the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, who were like the religious leaders of that day, really were only concerned about the outside. And so right after chapter 5, after the Beatitudes, Jesus says things like, well, the law says that if somebody hits you, it's okay, you can hit them back. But then he takes it to the invisible. He says, but, but I tell you, if you've got like hate in your heart towards your brother, that it's, it's not okay. And then he talks about the law and how, you know, talks about adultery and if you commit adultery, that's wrong and everybody would agree with that. But then he takes it at another level. He says, but I'm saying, he says, if you're lusting after someone that not, you're not in a covenant relationship with, it's not your wife or husband, that it's wrong. And so he, he takes this outward works type religion and he's making it very much about what's going on on the inside. And I'm finding now that, which is amazing to me, that the heart is spoken about more in the Bible than worship, than works, than giving, than belief and obedience. Like, these are big things. Worship, works, obedience, like belief. All of those are major, major things. But the heart comes up more than all of those. And so he's, he's kind of unlocked. I think Jesus is showing us this gospel that it, it really starts on the inside of us. It starts in the hidden world, however we want to call it, our, our heart, our soul, our mind, our spirit. And we could spend a lot of time on that. But, but I'm, I want to say it's, it's our inside world. When Jesus says that our heart should be pure, I think he's talking about our mind, our thoughts, our emotions, everything that's going on that's kind of invisible to the world around us. And the heart is complicated. <laughs> I'm not a heart surgeon, uh, but I know that that's one of the hardest, hardest fields of medicine to become a, an expert in or to even be able to practice in. Because there's so much that goes on with the heart. And everything that you do in your body physically is dependent upon a healthy heart. And so, and so here we have Jesus again. He's using a physical, he's using a, a physical analogy that we can all understand to help us spiritually. And he's saying that when our heart is not pure and there's some things going on on the inside of us, that it, it's going to show up on the outside of our life. And then it's going to block us from seeing God. 
There's going to be like a, a, there's going to be a disconnect there. Jeremiah said it like this, 17 verse 9, the heart, it's deceitful above all things and, and beyond cure. And he asked this question, who can understand it? Then I believe he answers that question in verse 10. The Lord. <laughs> He's the only one. And he searches the heart and he examines the mind and he rewards each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. And so when I look at you and when we look at each other, we really see the outside and we see our physical bodies. But we know that when God looks at us, he looks beyond that and he looks at the heart. He sees the inside world. And when we get the inside world right, the outside world begins to make sense. When we do the work on the inside, the outside wor world begins to, to get better. And so I just want to un unpack a couple of things because I, I believe that the way that we care for our heart, the more that we can understand it, the more that we can care for it. Right? That understanding something is the basis for care. If I buy a car, in order to take care of that car, I, I got to understand how it works and when the oil needs to get changed and when I need to get my checkup and you know, take it for the uh, you know, inspections and all these things. Well, our hearts, the inside world is the same way. Understanding is the basis of care. And the Bible says so much about the heart and I could only dwindle it, dwindle it down to just three things that I wanted you to see this morning before we, we jump in. But the first thing the Bible says about the heart is that our, our thoughts flow from the heart. Our head and our heart is connected. It's pretty incredible. Our head and our heart, what's going on up here is connected to what's going on in here. And in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus expounds on that. He says the things that come out of your mouth, your words, your motives, what you say, they come from the heart, and these defile them, right? This is it's, it's what's coming up from inside of us. For out of the heart come all of these things. He connects it to evil thoughts, and he gives a list of things that, that come from inside of us. That our, our, our mind and our heart are, are connected. Mark chapter 2, verse 8. There's a story here where Jesus is in a, a crowd, and he's with his disciples. And it says, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And so here's a man that could not only observe what was going on on the outside, but he knew the, the, the motive. He knew what was going on on the inside. He could, he could heal, hear and see and know people's thoughts, which is incredible to me. But what's even more interesting is he connects that to our, to our heart. The stuff that's going in our, in our head is connected to our heart. The second thing is our emotions, our feelings. And so sometimes we can just like discount those. Well, they're feelings. You, sh you should just get over that. If you got a bad feeling, don't listen to your feelings, right? We, I think you've heard that. You can't trust your feelings. Everybody would agree with that. You can't really, you can't set your course in life based on how you feel. Yeah, like if, if you lived your life based on feelings, there's probably a lot of mornings where you wouldn't go to work, right? You wouldn't push yourself. There's mornings where I certainly wouldn't be here. You know, I don't always feel like, get, you know, getting up. And I'm sure this morning coming to church, you may not have felt like coming, but you, you did it based on principle, not on feelings. And, but, but which is, is incredible to me is that all these emotions and feelings, the Bible, there's dozens and dozens of emotions that the Bible connects to our heart. And I want to just give you the seven major ones. There's a guy way smarter than me, he's a psychologist, Dr. Ekman, and he, he, he was dwindled down emotions to seven. And there's a verse for every emotion. Their fearful heart, Isaiah 35, verse 4, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He's going to have vengeance. He's going to take care of you. He's going to, with divine retribution, he will come to save you. So there we see fear connected to the heart, an angry heart. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 3, a person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. An angry heart, a joyful heart. Proverbs 15, verse 13, a glad heart 
makes a cheerful face. Come on, somebody. So when the heart is healthy, the face is going to show it. And if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, right? Yeah, your body is going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to come outside of you. A sad heart, Romans chapter 9, verse 2, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish, not in his mind, not in his soul or spirit, but in his heart, a contempt heart. Jeremiah 15, when your words came to me, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, God Almighty, a sick heart. Proverbs 13, verse 12, hope deferred when you really, 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 really want something and you thought for sure it was going to happen and you had all the plans and you financed it and you put a ring, you know, come on. <laughs> you thought for sure this was going to work out. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, sick heart. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Surprise, excitement, Luke 24. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning surprise within us while they were walking and talking to Jesus? They didn't know who he was, but their hearts were surprised. And see, I, I'm finding in, in my life that feelings and emotions whatever you want to call them, they're not always right, but they're always real. And so what you're feeling, and when your heart is sad, and when your heart is sick, or your heart is down, or your heart is joyful, though these feelings and emotions, as much as you can't, you can't, you can't live your life based on how you feel day to day, but they sure are good gauges. Just like the gauges in your car, when something pops up on that on that dashboard, you know, okay, there's something under the hood I need to look at. And so feelings and emotions that well up from within our hearts can tell us something about what's going on inside of us. And so we can repress them or we can ignore them or we can just fake it till we make it and not let anybody know what we're feeling or going through. That's one way to do it. But the Bible, I think, has a different way to do it. It says you've got to listen to those things. You've got to listen to your heart. Because just like bad stuff comes out of our heart, we know that really good stuff comes out of our heart. People that change the world change it because they're led by their hearts, not their minds. Einstein said this, don't let your head get in the way of your heart. He was the smartest man that ever lived. I think he's a brilliant man. He said, don't let your head get in the way of your heart. Because just like the Bible says, the heart is deceitful and there's all kinds of things there that, that well up from within us that are bad. There's also all kinds of, you know, desire is not always bad. Desire can be really good. People that change the world and do great things are full of desire and passion. And they love what they do and they love who they do it with. And then people that do really, really bad things and change the world in really bad ways are also driven from that place. And so we see a, a two-edged sword here. So my heart is connected to my thoughts, it's connected to my emotions. And then the third thing I want you to see are, is my actions. My actions flow from my heart. And so that's why Solomon, the, the wisest man that's ever lived apart from Jesus, Proverbs 4 verse 23 said this. He said, you know, guard your house, guard your cars, guard your money, guard your stuff. <laughs> we do that pretty well. He said, guard your heart above everything, above guarding your mind and guarding your finances and guarding your, your stuff and your family. And you should do all that. He said, above all that, you need to guard what you're letting inside of you because out of your heart, everything you do flows from it. Have you ever done something and just like asked yourself the question, what in the world was I thinking like, where did that come from? I didn't want to do that. I didn't plan on doing that. But they said it, and I reacted, and this is what I did. Where did that come It's like it just fell out of the sky, right? It came from here. It came from this hidden part. And, and so the, the, the book of Proverbs talks so much about the heart and, and guarding the heart. But, but we know the, the difference here is not... He's not saying guard your heart in a way like build super tall walls around it and don't let anybody in. That's not what he means. I think what he means is it's more like a fence. It's a, it's a guarding your heart. It's like putting up a fence. And a fence has a gate. 
So we let good things in, right? And then we keep bad things out. <laughs> and so how do we do that? How, how, do, how do we do that in an in a everyday, like, practical way? How do we keep our hearts pure? How do we keep our hearts clean? Because I know that I don't have to convince you that life is from the moment that you come to consciousness, there's a brutal, brutal attack on your heart. Stuff happens to you, people leave you, people that should have been there aren't there. And so these things don't just, just affect our minds, don't just affect our lives, but they do something on the inside of us. Our hearts. My, my son, he's six years old, and he watched The Wizard of Oz at school a couple months ago, and he came home and started telling me about this movie. And I thought, man, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir right now because uh, I love the movie Wizard of Oz. Anybody, I'm sure everybody in here has seen that movie, The, the Wizard of Oz. It's a brilliant, brilliant movie. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on in this movie, but there's a few characters in the movie that are lacking something, right? There's the, the scarecrow. And he was a little off in the head, right? Or he needed a brain. And um, uh, there was another character. There was a lion. He came home talking about the lion uh, and how he lacked courage. And so he had it on the outside, but he didn't have it on the inside. And, uh, and then there was this other guy, the, the Tin Man. Y'all know the Tin Man, right? So they show up to the Tin Man's house, and the Tin Man's just stuck, frozen. And I'd watched the movie. We ended up buying the movie. And so we got it now. They remade it. It's beautiful. They remade it in like, I mean, it was, I think it was the first movie in color, which was kind of amazing. But they've remade it now, and it's, it's really beautiful. But, but I didn't know that there were stories behind each character and how they ended up where they were. I didn't know that. And when they showed up at the Tin Man, I, I didn't know this, but Frank, Frank Baum, who wrote The Wizard of Oz, there's a story behind the story with the Tin Man. So the Tin Man at one time was a regular man, and he was in love with a woman. And the witch hated it. She seen the love, didn't like the love that they shared, and so she cast a spell on him. And so when he was out there working in the field, this spell would overcome him, and so he actually he would hurt himself with the axe. He would mistakenly cut it cut his leg and so rather than taking the chance of hurting himself again he replaced it with metal and so one by one the tin man who used to feel and used to love a woman and used to have emotions and had a soft heart towards the world and the people in his life he ends up like this you know you've seen the movie they show up and he's stuck and over time, after placing a leg, and it would make sense, right? Because if I got this spell on my life and this witch is out to get me, if I'm going to keep hurting myself, I might as well protect myself. And so he ends up a hollow shell of a person. Because he's replacing, rather than healing things in his life that maybe he should have healed, he just replaced it in, with metal. And so here comes Dorothy. <laughs> and you know the rest of the story. But I wonder how much that we do that in our own lives. And what was interesting to me about the tin man is he hurt himself. Right? He had this spell on his life, but nobody was coming up and attack. I mean, he was wounding himself. And then rather than healing from those wounds in his life, he just kind of took the easy way out and said, I'm just never going to be hurt again. And reminded me of a guy in the Bible who wrote pretty most of the Psalms. And you know who he is. His name is David. And he was a great man. The Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. But he had made some mistakes. He had some self-inflicted wounds in his life. One of them was a, a lady named Bathsheba. You, maybe you know the story. Maybe you don't. But here's King David. And in, in the, at the time, David was the most powerful king on the planet. So, so he had the largest empire, he had the largest kingdom, and it says in the time in 1 Samuel, when kings go to war, David stayed back. Don't know why, but instead of being out in battle, doing what God had called him to do, he was kind of chilling on his, on, his, on his temple roof top, 
and he was hanging around the edge and the ledge of this rooftop, and it just so happened in that day that women would bathe themselves on top of their roofs. And so maybe Bathsheba didn't think that anybody was around because all the men were at war. So maybe she, you know, she thought that there was you know, no way that anyone would see her taking a bath. But here's King David who should be at battle and he's not and he's hanging around and he looks down and he sees Bathsheba and he thinks, you know what, I'm the king. <laughs> so he calls for her and he makes a mistake, right? They, he sleeps with her. I guess he, I'm thinking he falls, falls in love with her because then he decides he wants to keep her as his own. And, and so it goes from adultery now. Here, again, this is a man that wrote most of your Bible in the book of Psalms, okay? This is a man that God says, I, this, he's a man after my heart, but he, he made some really bad mistakes. <laughs> Self-inflicted wound, right? And then he thinks, well, I'm going to fix adultery with murder. So I'm going to send her husband off. I'm going to I'm going to take the you know I'm going to make sure that he's in the front of the battle so that he he's you know more likely to get killed and he and he does but here's the the dangerous part I think is David does all of this stuff and he commits adultery and then he sends this man her husband to be murdered and but he just keeps on rocking like nothing happened we don't see that he was sad or he repented or he just kind of goes back to what he was doing and just kind of rushes through life and loss and mistakes like nothing happened. And then David, in God's grace, God sent someone to meet with David. His name was just happened to be Nathan. That's why I tell this story all the time because Nathan's like the, okay, this prophet, just, his name just happened to be Nathan and and here's David, I don't know what he's doing, probably sipping a, a, a macchiato, I don't know, reading the, the Jerusalem Times, just being the king. Bathsheba's back there with the rest of his wives. She's just living. And, and uh, you know, whatever. Um, you know, he's killed lots of people. They sing songs about him. David's killed his thousands of people. So it's just another day. And, and then Nathan comes in and tells him a story. And he's like, hey, let me tell you a story real quick. You got time for a story? David's like, sure, I got time for a story. There was this man, he owned one sheep, and there was this another man, he owned like thousands of sheep. And the guy that owned thousands of sheep wanted this man's one sheep, and so he takes it. What should be done to that man? And David, the wise king, said he should be killed. And then Nathan <laughs> said, you're the man. <laughs> Dropped the mic, walked out. So David had some buildup going on in his heart. Up until recently, I didn't know much about heart disease, and now I'm like a student in it. And I'm finding that when your heart has something wrong with it, it doesn't show up in your heart. It, it's going to show up in other areas. Symptoms. You might feel a tingling in your fingers, shortness of breath. You can actually lose your sight from heart disease. <laughs> didn't know that. But it's there. And what began to happen with David is I, I want to think that as he just kept rushing through life and he had all this stuff building up, it began to show up in his life in areas. His heart was sick. And Nathan came and called him out on him. And this is where we get Psalm 51, which is probably one of the greatest psalms that David ever wrote. But I want you to see it came on the heels of his greatest mistake. A self-inflicted wound. He did something really bad. There's no discounting that. He, 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 I mean, he committed adultery. We know that's wrong. He murdered somebody. We, we all know if we took straws in here this morning, everybody would say, yeah, that's on the list. That's not wrong. That's not right. It's definitely wrong, right? So David was not perfect by any means. But I want you to see what he does when, when God brings it out and brings it into his consciousness. Because I really think that he just didn't even see it. He just didn't even see it. And when, when Nathan called it out in his life and it came, he became aware of it, he wrote Psalm 51. And it's known as a psalm of repentance. And I, and I think it's a parallel passage to how do, we, how do we keep our hearts clean in a world that's, that can be brutal on us at times. In a world where there is an enemy, 
that wants to wound us so bad that we decide that we're just going to shut everybody out and we're going to just protect ourselves and live like that, like the tin man. How do we keep a clean heart? How do we keep a, 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 a soft heart? Well, David shows us. I'm so glad that we can learn from the mistakes of these men and women in the Bible. And it wasn't on the mountaintop that he wrote this psalm. This was he was pouring and crying and pouring his heart out to God. And, and I want to just give you three things out of this psalm, and then we're going to pray. The first thing he says, I'm going to give it to you. Have mercy on me, O God. Verse 1. He calls out for God's mercy. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. He starts confessing. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sins. And I think one of the ways that we keep a clean heart in a polluted world is we confess our wrongdoings to the people in our life that we know love us. He confessed his faults to God first and then a trusted confidant. Somebody knew what was going on in David's life. Even though he was the king, and even though he was probably incredibly intimidating, and everybody was scared of him, and he could literally take someone's life with just his word, he's modeling this for us. He's showing that if you want to keep a clean heart and a tender heart towards God, we got to have a healthy, healthy dose of confession in our life. Because we have a system of elimination for all the bad stuff. Like our body, we breathe in oxygen. Go ahead and try that. We breathe in the good stuff. We let out the stuff that the trees like, right? It's pretty amazing. We have a system of elimination for things that are toxic. We eat all day. You can get the picture. Uh, your body has a way of getting rid of the bad stuff in your life. Your car has a system of elimination. The motor runs, it's a combustion engine. If you got an electric car, I don't know how that works, but in a, 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 a one that, that burns diesel or gas, it has an exhaust. And so the, the, the bad stuff gets out. Well, how do we get the stuff in our heart that builds up over time out? It's confession. It's James 5, it's confess your faults one to another. Why? Not so that you can be saved, not so that you can go to heaven, but so you can be healed. So your heart can stay tender, your heart can stay pure, so you don't end up like the tin man, alone and shutting everybody out in your life, afraid of what might happen, afraid of what might happen to you. So he had a healthy diagnosis, he had a healthy rhythm of confession in his life. And Mark Batterson said this, the things that we don't confess, we repress. And that's the number one reason for heart blockages, right? I mean, there's, there's, you can inherit it. It's nothing that you've done on your own. You just got bad genes. But then it's what we're eating. It's our diet. This stuff just builds up naturally inside of our heart. And that word is pretty cool. Blessed are the pure in heart. That word pure is katharos, where we get the English word catheter. So, and so basically what Jesus is saying is blessed is the person that's doing the heart work and not letting stuff build up inside of their life. And so David, he pours his heart out to God. He pours his heart out to God. And then the second thing he does, verses 3 through 5, talking to God, he says, I know my transgressions, Lord. My sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned. I've done this evil in your sight. He's coming clean. So you are right in your verdict. You're justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And so what is he doing? I'll tell you, I'll, let me show you what he's not doing. He's not blaming Bathsheba. God, if she wouldn't have been taking a bath up there, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, I'm going to put up some big fences and I'm going to put a decree out that if you take a bath on top of your house, you better have a fence. Or, you know, like, you know, like that's kind of, that's what I like to do. It's not my fault. It's if, if you would have been in my situation, he didn't say that. If you would have had my mom and dad, he didn't say that. He owns it. He says, God, this is my fault. It ain't Bathsheba's fault. It ain't the bathtub's fault. It ain't, the fa it ain't her husband's fault. It ain't nobody's fault. This is something I, he completely owned what he did. 
And he's not blaming his mama or his grandma or his grandpa or anything like that. He says, this is me, it's mine. And, and he goes on, he says, I've been this way since the day I was born. And aren't you glad that you inherited all that stuff? <laughs> Aren't you glad? I mean, and so, so he, he goes back to the very beginning, and he's not projecting anymore. Isn't that like step one, right? In AA, like, like you, you, you admit, it's, 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 I, I'm owning my stuff. I'm owning my brokenness. I'm not, I'm not putting it on anybody else anymore. If we really, really want to keep our hearts pure, we want to see God and sense God in our life, we can't, we can't blame other people for our problems. Because then the problem's not in the room anymore. Right? Well, she did this, or they did that, or you, you weren't there. With the, you didn't see the way I was raised. And so now we're just pu- putting the problem somewhere else. Rather than this, I was created in iniquity. That's what David said. You, he, David, open it. I mean, just open before God. Lord, you see all this stuff in me. I didn't pray for this. I didn't ask for this. And here's the last thing. We're going to last couple of verses and we're going to, anybody, just helping anybody? For I, I know my transgressions. They're ever before me. He owns his brokenness. And then here's this part I really want you to see. Verse 10. He prays this beautiful prayer that I think is the key to, to, this, to this psalm. Create in me a clean heart. Created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. And I want you to see what he was afraid of. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. And so clearly David felt this distance and he wanted to be back close to God. And he's seen right in front of him as crystal clear as it had ever been that it wasn't anybody else's fault and it wasn't anybody else's responsibility that he had to confess the stuff in his life. He had to own it. But then he asked. He asked. I think sometimes we assume, well, I go to church and I sing the songs and I read my Bible. Surely my heart is okay. I'm in the right place. But David didn't leave anything up to assumptions. He asked God, create in me. That word create is like to make something out of nothing. He's saying, God, take this heart of mine, and it's in the condition that I'm in, and just make it new. And I'm so thankful this morning that we have a God who's able to do that. That doesn't tell us to work it out on our own doesn't tell us, well, you're going to need to go to therapy for that, right? Now, I'm not discounting that because I think it helps. It really helps. Come on, somebody. But God, at the end of the day, holds every human's heart in his hands. And there's nothing hidden from him. And here's a man that God used some incredible words to describe. That he was after his own heart. That made a brutal mistake. But God didn't give up on him. God didn't tell him to go find help somewhere else. He made him new. So I just want you to bow your heads for a moment and just put your hand on your heart. Because I think what can happen is we just go through life and through loss and pain and mistakes that we even make on our own. it begins to build up stuff inside of our heart. And oftentimes we don't even know it's there until something triggers it, a reaction. Somebody said something and there was this reaction or this response that I don't know why I did that. I don't know why I reacted that way. Well, maybe there's a ma- it's a matter of the heart. And today, with your hand on your heart, let's just ask God, Lord, can you you give us a new heart this morning? Can you create in all of us a clean heart? A pure heart, Lord, that wants to see you 
in the world and see you in our job and see you in whatever we do Monday through Friday, whatever it is that you've put in front of us to do. Lord, we want to we see you in everything. And so we come to you today with our hands on our hearts and ask to give us a, a clean heart. If there's any blockages in there, if there's any stuff that's building up from years ago that maybe we don't even know is there, we just pray that your Holy Spirit right now would make us clean. And so Jesus, we come to you today and we, we give you our hearts everything that we are, all the emotions, the good, the bad, the ugly, all that stuff that's in there. Only you know the heart of man. Only you know our hearts. Only you can see on the inside. And so we come to you, Lord, and we ask, give us clean hands and a pure heart. Renew us today. God, and we just thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen.